Dr. Bill Stixrud is a leading clinical neuropsychologist and director of the Stixrud Group, a Washington, D.C.-based group practice specializing in the neuropsychological assessment of children, adolescents, and adults with learning, attentional, social, and or emotional disorders. Dr. Stixrud lectures frequently on neuropsychological assessment, learning and executive disorders, brain development, motivation, and the effects of transcendental meditation, stress, sleep deprivation, and technology overload on the brain. Dr. Stixrud is, we're also fortunate to have him, he has a one-year waiting list for his Silver Spring, uh, Maryland practice for adolescents to see him. Please welcome Dr. Bill Stixrud. So it's true, I, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, and for the last 30 years I've made a living by testing kids who have learning issues or attention problems or autism or emotional problems. And it's, it's a fantastic job, and in part because it's, it's, it's interesting and fulfilling, and, and in part because I love the answers that kids give me to questions. I've been following this boy for some years who, uh, I saw him first when he was five, and he's now a young adult and doing extremely well. But what I remember most when he was five, I asked him the first question from a, a, a test of vocabulary. I said, what's a cow? And he said, I can't believe you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so t t tonight, tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, TM and the teenage brain. And what I'm going to focus on is, is how is the teenage brain different from an adult brain? And... Um, and why do, why do adolescent brains desperately need meditation? And how can TM prevent and treat the kinds of problems that are so absurdly prevalent in, in young people these days? So the first thing I want to tell you, uh, but a couple, I want to uh, focus on a couple of brain structures and chemicals uh, for our purposes. Fred talked about the prefrontal cortex, and that's a big part of our story. And I also want to tell you about the amygdala. How, how many know the amygdala? So the amygdala is part of our, the brain's threat detection system. And the amygdala is sensitive to emotional context of experience, but it's really sensitive to anything that's potentially threatening, so fear, anger. And when the amygdala senses threat, it will start your fight-or-flight response, your stress response. And when you're in your right mind, what happens is your prefrontal cortex will, will regulate the rest of the brain. It'll guide your thinking and behavior, and it'll, it'll regulate the amygdala. It'll calm the amygdala down. And when you're, when you're stressed, what happens is that the amygdala is regulating your rest of the brain. And it, so one of the first points, the, the, the major point about adolescent brain is that this prefrontal cortex is very slow to mature. We know that, that the cognitive functions of the prefrontal cortex aren't mature until 25 plus minus 3. The emotional regulation functions aren't mature until 32 plus minus 3. So those of you who have immature boyfriends, I mean, they're, 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 they're still help. But I will say, that I, I, I lecture about the most useful stuff I've learned about kids' brains, and this is the number one thing, because it's so encouraging. It gives people hope. With kids who, people whose kids are struggling, they're uh, struggling when they're 16, to tell them they're going to have a different brain when they're 18 or they're 20 or they're 24. And as this cortex matures, what happens is that not only does it become more mature in the way it functions, it comes online and it starts to do stuff that it didn't used to do. So if I showed you a picture of somebody experiencing fear, what activates in your brain is a little bit in the amygdala, because the amygdala senses the fear, but a lot in the prefrontal cortex. You show a 16 or 17-year-old a picture of somebody who, who's, who's afraid, and they have trouble judging what the emotion is, and what activates in their brain is largely the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex doesn't activate very much to do that. It comes online, and it progressively comes online, and so much of the transition between being a kid and being adult is this unfolding of the prefrontal cortex. And what I'm concerned about is that so many kids that I see, and, and whether they're poor, whether they're rich, whether they're uh, smart, whether they have learning issues, and you could be you could be smart and have learning issues too, but they're they're so stressed, and I worry that that they may not be developing healthy prefrontal cortex. 
And the second point I want to make about the adolescent brain, the second thing that's, that's different, well, it, well, I'll just say, this is just a slide that illustrates this idea that this is um, how the purple is the more mature. And you can see how dramatically uh, more purple there is at age 20 than there is at age 12. And this study didn't go past age 20, but if you go past age 20, uh, you, you, it becomes even more dramatic. Now, the second major thing about a teenage brain is that there's changes in the brain's reward system. And what I'm talking about is these, these deep centers in the brain that send the neurotransmitter dopamine to the rest of the brain. And dopamine, you think about it, it's the power switch. It's the energy source. Dopamine is what you have in your brain when you're excited about something, when you're motivated about something, when you're, you're, you're anticipating something cool happening. You have high levels of dopamine. And what, what happens in, in teenagers is that they have particularly high levels of dopamine to anything that's rewarding, so anything that's pleasurable. So if, if you have teenagers involved in a gambling kind of uh, situation where they can win money, and they have these huge spikes in dopamine compared to adults, the idea of winning the money is just so much more pleasurable, it's more exciting. If you just give them sugar water, you see a bigger, <laughs> you see a, you see a, a bigger spike uh, in, in, in dopamine. And, um, and so, uh, and the main thing is, is that the thing that's most rewarding for teenagers is other teenagers. We, that, that from an evolutionary point of view, that, that, that teens want to spend more time with other teens, and they laugh together louder than we laugh, and they're, 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 that life is more exciting in some ways, life is harder in other ways. But it's this change in the dopamine and this immature prefrontal cortex that places teenagers at risk for being impulsive and for addiction. And I, I may talk a little bit more about those things. Now, another point I want to make about this adolescent brain is that it's incredibly powerful, creative, adaptive. Neanderthals, it turned out, didn't have adolescence. They were kind of mature by the time that they were 10. And people think that, that humans had an evolutionary advantage because we had adolescents who, are, 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 who can explore, who want to take risks, who will go out and, 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 and look over the other side of the mountain. And it's, it's incredibly powerful. I, I heard an interview with Bob Dylan where he was asking, could you write the kind of songs you wrote when you were 20 now? He said, are you kidding? Where'd that come from? And it came from an adolescent brain. It came from a brain that's not fully mature. And at the same time, the adolescent brain is vulnerable. And it, it's vulnerable to, to the effects of chemicals. It's, it, it's vulnerable to alcohol. It's more vulnerable than the adult brain to the effects of drugs. And it's more vulnerable to the, the, than the adult brain to the effects of stress hormones. So we, we know that, that adolescents, because they're more vulnerable, that they're really stressed. And especially, especially when they learn to drive. <laughs> and we know that stress affects the developing brain more than it does a mature brain. And that stress can change the developing brain in a way that can have long-term effects. And so, um, and it turns out that kids these days are really stressed. That there is um, a recent study of the American Psychological Association found that teenagers now report similar levels of stress uh, to, to adults. And there's a woman, there's a woman at the University of uh, San Diego State by the name of Jean Twenge, who had the brilliant idea to study responses to um, these personal, this personal, personality inventory, the MMPI, of people who, who young people, older adolescents and, and, and people in their early 20s, who completed this thing in the 1930s, 1950s, 1960s. And what she found was that contemporary kids, kids in the 2000s, were five to eight times more likely to report the symptoms of anxiety disorder or, or depression, major depression, than people were the, than young people were at the height of the Great Depression or during World War II. And why might this be? There's a lot of hypotheses. Some, some have to do with the incredible level of sleep deprivation that young people experience. Some people think it has to do with the increased academic pressure and competition, the fact that the kids don't play very much. Certainly, a lot of, there's a lot of speculation about the effects of 24-7 use of technology. And it's, it, it's a little frightening to know that, that, that the more time kids spend in front of a screen, 
The more attention problems they have, the more behavior problems, the, the more psychological problems, the more physical health problems. And this vulnerability to stress, it's a big deal in, in many ways, and not least of which is that one of the major tasks of being a, a teenager and a young adult is learning. And um, we, we know that, um, that when you're stressed, I mean, you, you have the experience yourself, it's hard to pay attention. It's very hard to pay attention to something other than what you're stressed about. And from an evolutionary point of view, it makes sense because if you were attacked by a predator, it wouldn't make much sense to focus on something else. It, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't go well. It, and, by the same, and, and the deeper parts of our brain that do the stress response, they don't know the difference between being late for work and, 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 and facing a predator. So it's just the way our brains work. We evolve that when we're stressed, we respond instinctively. We aren't supposed to learn. We aren't supposed to evaluate information. We aren't supposed to commit uh, complex things to long-term memory and retrieve it easily, and we can't. And so that um, Amy, Amy um, Arnston, who is a major stress university at Yale, says the prefrontal cortex, it, it's the Goldilocks of the brain. What she means by that is that the, the prefrontal cortex depends on a very delicate balance of the neurotransmitters that run it, basically dopamine and norepinephrine. And without this balance, that is, it's hard to focus, it's hard to think clearly. And what happens when you're stressed is, these, is your levels of dopamine and norepinephrine just skyrocket. Your brain, your brain gets flooded with, it, with these chemicals, and you can't function. So, um, and if, if after the question and answer, if, if you think to, uh, ask me about my experience as a student at the University of California, Berkeley. I have an interesting story about this. Um, but so it's not surprising. I, I've been following people's attempts to apply brain research to, to education for 40 years now, and by far. The most common implication from brain, brain research to education is, that, is, is this, is that the optimal internal state for learning is relaxed alertness. Because you, you have to be focused, you have to be alert, but you can't be stressed. And we know, too, that the optimal educational environment is characterized by high challenge, low threat. That, it, that we, we're bored if we aren't sufficiently challenged, but if we're threatened, our brain doesn't work. And so TM, let me talk to you a little bit about TM. What we know uh, about TM in, in relation to, uh, to, to learning is that it seems to do to the, the teenage brain about what it does to the adult brain. In, in other words, if, if young people meditate, it works. And Fred's studies of, of middle school students, of, of college students, find that you, you that you see these changes in the electrical activity of the brain that allow for better concentration. That when you're less stressed, you can focus better, you can resist distraction better, and when you have this increased coherence in brain functioning, you can organize your thinking better. You can, you, you have, your sense of priorities is better. You can integrate information better. You see a, you see a larger perspective. And um, so there's a lot of evidence now that, that TM, including these things, that the improved learning, school performance, a lot of evidence, this faster processing speed, higher nonverbal intelligence, this improved executive functions. And in my field, the executive functions, which include planning and organiz organization and the ability to inhibit and the ability to be flexible, are, are considered much better predictors of how you do in life than IQ. And these are, it's a big deal in the, in the fact that by organizing the brain, by the, this, this experience of transcendence, improving the way the brain functions, improving these executive functions, it's really a big deal from a learning point of view. And from, from a mental health point of view, people are talking about an epidemic of mental health problems in adults and, and, and young people as well. In addition to the anxiety and de depression, there is unprecedented levels of chemical use and sleep disorders and self-cutting and self-burning and, and uh, chemical problems. And um, the, the, the experts in child mental health say that a lot of this stuff 
maybe most of it, can be, pre can be prevented because these problems are all stress-related problems. And that if you, if you look, at, if you do a, a functional imaging of, of brains of adolescents and, and adults who have anxiety disorders or depression, what shows up more consistently than anything else is a hyperactive amygdala. An amygdala that, that is bigger, stressed, when you're stressed for a long time, your amygdala gets bigger, it, it gets more reactive. You look at somebody who's been traumatized or somebody who's really stressed, and their amygdala lights up like a Christmas tree. These, these are stress-related disorders. And you can just take stress chemicals, the stress hormones, and, and, and inject them to a rat, and a rat will, will start, well, it doesn't like, it doesn't start to cry or anything, but it starts, it, it, it gets lethargic and it, it looks depressed. So these things are stress-related problems, and, um, and th these things, uh, th what happens is that, as I said before, that, that stress affects the, teen the, the teenage brain more. And so what happens, if a kid gets depressed, say at age 14, who'd never been depressed before, and, and the average age of onset now of depression is 13, used to be 42. But if it gets it's depressed, the idea, people are saying that it scars the brain, that it makes some changes in the brain that even if it gets better, still may be more pessimistic, still have more sleep-related problems. And what we know about TM, there's no, there are no studies of clinical populations, except for a couple studies of ADHD. But there's no studies of kids who have anxiety disorders or, or, or depression. But there are several studies in adolescents, including middle school, high school, and college, who, of, 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 that show significant reductions in anxiety, particularly trait anxiety. So people who tend to be chronically anxious that re experience significant reductions in anxiety. One of the really important things from my point of view is there's also a significant reduction in emotional reactivity, that, that, that people don't respond in maladaptive ways to emotional upset uh, if they meditate. And when I talk with kids, one of the things I really emphasize with them, because I see a lot of vulnerable kids, is the need to build their stress tolerance, their ability to, to manage themselves in stressful situations so they don't quit or they don't freak out. And I think that one of the interesting things here is that we also see, again, there's no studies of teenagers or, or young adults who are depressed, but we, we do see in several studies improvement in mood, where people start to be more positive, that report greater happiness, less negative mood. And part of it uh, has to be that it improves sleep. And as, as somebody who thinks a lot about how do we help teenagers who are profoundly sleep deprived get more sleep, that some of this has to do with the fact that one of the things that, that shows up in, in several studies, and including these new studies on, on post-traumatic stress, is how quickly meditation helps to normalize sleep. And there's great promise here uh, uh, for, for, for teachers. There's some beautiful new evidence about dramatic reduction in teacher stress and burnout. And there's a really promising uh, evidence that TM can be an important tool for helping kids with autism. And I have to say, I, I just I love working with kids with autism. I, I, I was testing one a couple of, uh, weeks ago who was 10. And she looked behind me, and she saw a picture of me in a, in a tuxedo and my daughter in a wedding gown. She says, you got married? I said, yeah, I did 37 years ago. And, and I said, that, that's me and my daughter. And she said, you married your daughter? <laughs> and, uh, but but my, my, my friend, my friend and, and former colleague, um, uh, David... Black and, and Norman Rosenthal, who figured out seasonal affective disorder and, and along with Bobby Roth, um, yeah, uh, wrote arguably the best existing book on TM, um, have done very interesting pilot work on, on autism that I will tell you more about. And the last thing I want to tell you, um, well, I, I'll tell you a story about this later. Um, I, I'm completely in the tank for the David Lynch Quiet Time uh, uh, programs. The research on it is showing where, where kids are meditating twice a day in school, is showing improvement in all kinds of important areas. And I'll tell you about exp uh, some of my own experiences uh, in the question and, and answer. And the last thing I'll say is that because of the reward, because teens are so rewarding to each other, 
What I'm focusing on now in, in my own work is trying to get kids in schools to meditate together, developing meditation clubs or even meditation buddies, having schools develop uh, study halls where kids can meditate. Because teenagers, they typically don't want to do stuff that other kids aren't doing. And the, the, the brilliance of these David Lynch school programs is that everybody's doing it. And I ask kids, when I, when, I, when I see all kinds of anxious, unhappy kids, I said, what has anybody told you about how to prevent stress or how to make yourself feel better when you're really stressed? And I don't have one kid in 100 who has anything useful to say. And it seems to me that given what we know about what TM can do to, to improve the lives of young people, I think it's cruel not to teach it to them, at least give them a chance to do it. Thank you.